All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Sound Words Bible Church. Uh, we'd like to welcome the Watkins family all the way from Indiana. We're so thrilled that you guys could be here. Uh, I got a couple quick announcements. Announcement number one is going to be uh, the Bible Conference in Medina, t- Tennessee. That's coming up the weekend of October 25th. Go to soulsarborchurch.com, and if you hit uh, Mini Bible Conference tab, all the details are there. Uh, that is still on, and we've got uh, quite a few families that are coming from all over. Spoke with one uh, this morning from Mississippi, so we're going to have a great time of fellowship there. A uh, wonderful time uh, spending in the Word, and also that evening, I believe, they're going to put on their fall festival. So there's going to be a bunch of activities going on that evening. Uh, let's see also like to welcome all of those families who tune in online. I know we've got quite a few. The Akers come to mind, the, the Fry family and the Johnsons. Uh, also, uh, if, you're, if you're watching now or at a later time, just, just do us a favor and drop where you're from, the, the location, because I, I know a lot of families are, are looking for fellowship and they're trying to get connected with other families in their area. And if you never know who might just be right down the road. So uh, I want to encourage you to do that as well. All right, we're going to sing a few songs before we jump into the message uh, this morning. So if you have the song booklet, we're going to page 33 in the song booklet. You guys bow with me in a word of prayer. Our great God and Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you so much, Father, for this morning where we can gather together and magnify your name and your word. God, this morning as we come from all different walks of life, all different seasons, the one thing that we know that is constant and true is your word. This morning I pray that we just have hearts, eyes, ears just ready to receive your word, and that your word, Lord, not my word, your words would just have free course this morning. Pray this all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. I've titled today's message, The Role of the Holy Spirit. And I think that this message um, is something that is really confusing today for most folks. I think that there is a a great misunderstanding when it comes to the Holy Spirit and what He's doing today. And I hope that after this morning's message that God's Word would bring clarity to some of these points of confusion that we're going to touch on. So I'm going to read the passage of Scripture. Uh, We're in Ephesians chapter 1. And we'll jump... In at verse 12, uh, we'll jump in and in verse 11. Paul, writing to the saints and faithful at Ephesus, he tells them, In whom, speaking of Christ, also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom, Christ, ye also trusted, after that ye heard of the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory." Give it a second to let that sink in. So the subject matter today is going to be the Holy Spirit. I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations over the years and in passing. And you hear things like people say, you know, I heard God speak to me. I I clearly heard the voice of God speak to me, and it was this. And 
things like that happen all the time. And there's a couple points that I want to touch on. One is going to be common and uncommon teachings today when it comes to the Holy Spirit. Two is going to be the supernatural versus study. Three, where God dwells today. And four, ultimately, is going to be the hope of glory. Now, I must give a disclaimer for this message because I do believe that this is a topic of, of much contention and it's a very controversy, uh, controversial topic. And where I'm coming at this is from my own experience. I'm coming uh, at it through the lens of what I've done in my times past in my religion, in my religious days, and how the Word of God is what ultimately matters when it comes to what God is doing today and what it has to say about it. So with that said, I want to talk, touch on a couple uncommon things. Now, the uncommon teachings, these are things that I've actually partaken part of in the past. There, believe it or not, there is doctrines going around, and this is almost shameful for me to even say, but things like toking the Holy Ghost, things like being drunk in the Spirit, slain in the Spirit, breathing in the Spirit of God, it's almost like and I, I liken all these things. I put them in the one bucket. It's like treating the Holy Spirit like this genie in a bottle. Right? And those things aren't even biblical. Like you can't even find biblical backing for some of those doctrines that are going today. And I'm not going to dive into it. Throw it in the Google machine. Go ahead and pull up what you're going to see on those doctrines. But then you've got common teachings of the Holy Spirit today. These are things like seeking the presence of God. These are things like looking for signs of His presence and signs for confirmation of what I'm supposed to do with my life. And even hearing God's voice. You know, I find it interesting when I think about the Bible in people that actually heard the voice of God. There's only really two Gentiles that come to my mind that actually had that experience. Abraham and Paul. But yet there's a lot of people. Paul was, he was Jew and Gentile in one body. It's kind of a little bit of a rabbit trail. and I don't want to go into that. But this idea that God speaks to people today and it's just a thought. That's how majority of Christianity, I think, is living their life. I had this thought, I'm in prayer, oh, this must be God speaking to me, right? Well, I want to talk to you about the voice of God. I'll, let's go to 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, hang a right. Now, uh, I feel a little bit of like a Dombey today, that's dad and zombie, Dombey in one, so I... Uh, not getting much sleep. I completely forgot my watch. So with that said, um, I'm going to need someone to play like uh, the Emmy music or something to give me a, a cue that I'm running out on time, but also I can observe and see when the eyes are glazed over and you guys are just like, I'm ready to get out of here. Let's go get some lunch. So we're in Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1. Notice what it says in verse 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. We'll read one more passage of Scripture. Let's hang a left. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Or in Hebrews chapter 1, notice what it says in verse 1 and 2. God, who at sundry times and divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. What did we just read? Well, let's go to our Bible timeline here. Peter just told us that the prophecy, the word, the voice of God, the words of God 
spoke through the prophets over here from Genesis through Malachi. That's where God spoke. He spoke by the mouth of the prophets. Right? That's what 2 Peter 1.21 is all about. But then when we read the book of Hebrews, it says that in these last days, Matthew all the way through Revelation, God has spoken to us through His Son, Jesus Christ. Now these are things that are all past tense, right? Something to just bookmark in your, in your brain and, and to think about. Because when you get to the Gospel of Matthew and you start reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're going to read things like, well, let's go to Matthew chapter 1. Let's angle left. And I want to go to Matthew chapter 1. I'm going to verse 21, Matthew 1, verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Talking about Israel there. Notice what it says in verse 22. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophets, saying, and then he's going to quote from the prophets, because God, the prophecy of, of the, the, God, the words of God didn't come by the will of man as they were moved by the Holy Ghost to speak these words. God spoke through the mouth of the prophets. And then when you get through Matthew and you read through those four gospel accounts, you're going to see this word fulfilled come up many times. I think it's like 57 times you're going to see fulfilled because Jesus said to himself, come, not to think that I come to destroy the law and the prophets, I came to fulfill them. He said that in Matthew chapter 5. And this, this idea that God just speaks to people's minds and that, that's God speaking, I'm, I'm trying to lay the, the, the case here that that's not how God works. That's not how it works, Okay. I want you to see this, this, even Jesus Christ, he always had the scriptures on his mind. You look at him as a boy. Where did he spend his time? In the temple. Why was he in the temple? Because they were reading the scriptures. Why were they reading the scriptures? Jesus knew he had to learn all of that because he was fulfilling all of it, even though I know that he was God and he knew it. But the point being is that Jesus always had the scriptures on his mind. So let's go to John chapter 19. Hang all right. John chapter 19, verse 28. This is Jesus Christ going through the horrific scene at Calvary. He's hanging on the cross. And in verse John chapter 19, verse 28, After this, Jesus, knowing all these things were now accomplished, that the, what? Scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. People that say that I heard God speak to me, and when they speak the thing, the next word that comes out of their mouth, if it's not the Scripture, that's not God. Okay? Jesus knew the Scripture. He is the Word of God. That's one of His names. And if you want to know the voice of God, know the Scriptures. There's times in my life when things get tough, or they're good, they're bad, it doesn't matter. I have thoughts that come to my mind. And any time that I hear the voice of God in my mind, it's the Scriptures. I can turn straight to it. I know it's written. I know that's the voice of God. That is something that I think is gravely mistaken nowadays. And it's scary when you think about what people do with some of that stuff. I mean, you go to the extreme, you have people saying, God told me to do this. And they do horrific scenes of terror. They're sick in the head. 
It's so important that you understand rightly dividing the word of truth because what God did in times past is not what God's doing today. We mentioned those things like seeking the presence of God, uh, signs of His presence, and uh, hearing God's voice. Yeah, God did that in times past through the prophets. But in these last days, He's spoken to us, to us through His Son. We now have the complete Word of God. We now can open up the Word. And every time I'm reading Scripture, it's literally the voice of God. Okay? So I want you to see, you, I want to show you now this, this importance of rightly dividing the Word of Truth because you've got to keep in mind the context. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 10. Hang a left. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. Now, uh, in the context here, Jesus appoints his twelve. He gave them power against unclean spirits, casting them, able to cast them out, heal all manner of sickness, all manner of disease. And he sends forth his twelve, telling them, don't go on the way to Gentiles, and, but go rather to lost sheep of the house of Israel, telling them to preach the kingdom of the heaven. And notice what he tells them in verse 16. He says, Jesus to the twelve, Behold, I send you forth as sheep, in the midst of wolves, be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But be aware, beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues, and they shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what Ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour that ye shall speak. Let's go to Luke chapter 12. It's another, um, it's another passage, but it ties in with what we just read, and we'll summarize that. So we're going to write Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. Notice what it says in verse 11. It's a very similar account. And when they bring you unto the synagogues and unto magistrates and powers, take ye no thought how or what thing ye shall answer or what ye shall say, for the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what ye ought to say. So this whole entire teaching of God supernaturally speaking through people, this is where they get that inspiration from. Right? That's where the that's where the source of inspiration comes are these two passages of scripture. They think they can walk their, their life live their life and you know what? I don't need to worry about what I'm gonna say. God's just gonna give me the words to speak. Right? That's not how it works. <laughs> that's not how any of this works. Yes, that's what God spoke to the twelve, but keep in mind when the twelve were here, the book of Acts and Romans through Revelation weren't even written. Paul isn't even on the scene here. So that's why it's really important for you to understand context and how God was dealing with man during that time. God is just dealing with Israel here. He's dealing with the twelve. And the twelve actually did all these things. They were delivered up before the councils and the governors. You can read about it in the book of Acts. You can see all these things. And God was supernaturally working through them, pouring out the Holy Spirit on them at Acts chapter 2. Let's go there. Acts chapter 2. Now this is after the cross at Calvary. And this is where a majority of Christianity thinks that the church, the body of Christ, started. They're gravely mistaken there. But notice in Acts chapter 2, after uh, you see, this is where people get inspiration for drunk in the spirit. Uh, go to verse 14. Now, the, the, the tongues, the fire have fallen. They're, they're speaking all in a known language. These weren't made up languages. Very important for you to understand that. And in verse 14, Peter's explaining to Israel what's happening here. Verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. It is 9 a.m. Verse 16. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. 
and I'm not going to read through 17 through 20. You can read through it, but I'm going to summarize it. He's going to quote Joel chapter 2, and it's about pouring out his spirit on the young men who will see visions and dreams and all of these things that, that God prophesied through the prophet Joel regarding Israel. That's not regarding us. This was part of the, the program for that gospel of the circumcision. But a lot of people today, are, they're not rightly divine the word of truth, so they're naturally thinking that, oh, this is me, this is what God's doing today, and I should be seeing dreams, I should be seeing visions. And their minds then get puffed up with these ideas and they see things and they call it out. And then people will gravitate. Oh, you heard this. You saw this. God speaking to you. And then you just have this thing running rampant today. And I'm telling you right now. That is not what God's doing today. It creates confusion. God is not the author of confusion. And if you just read the words on the pages of your Bible, it will just straight up tell you and explain it to you. You can see it. They, they didn't have the, the 12 here and, and right up to here in Acts 2 where we just read. They did not have the revelation of the mystery that was given to Paul. That is so important for you to understand that. They didn't have the complete fulfilled word of God. It wasn't until you got to Paul in Acts chapter 9 and then uh, through 28 that we got the full revelation of the mystery and we got the fulfilled Word of God. Go to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Hang a right. Colossians chapter 1. Notice what Paul told the church at Colossae, verse 25, Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to what? Fulfill the word of God. Paul's epistles, his 13 epistles, fulfilled the word of God. God's word is complete. God has said everything that he wants us to know. And it's right here. And if you want to know it, you got to open it up. You got to read it. You got to study. You got to put the work in. You got to learn the scriptures, know them, so that you can now discern between what is the voice of God, the scriptures, versus what are your own thoughts. So important. We don't have the luxury of the 12 to just go willy nilly in this life and just expect that God's just going to. Hit us with lightning and these thoughts and being able to speak the Word of God. That's not what God's doing today. Look what he tells, look what Paul tells us. Christ speaking through Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 13. We're in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13. Paul tells Timothy. Till I come, give attendance to what? Reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. So he's basically telling Timothy, you know what you need to do? Get in my 13 books. Read them. Those are the words of Christ. These are the instructions that you're supposed to do today. It's very simple. It doesn't take you but a couple hours to read through those 13 books just like that. And you read through those 13 books, it'll change your life. There's another thing that, that Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Take it right. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. And, it, and it tends us to give the reading to exhortation and to doctrine. Here's the key, Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Study. Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Take these 13 letters, Timothy. Take my words that were given unto me through Jesus Christ. Study it. Compare it through the rest of the Scriptures. 
You do these things, the God of peace shall be with you. That's what he told the Philippians. You, do, you hear, see, do these things, God of peace is going to be with you. Why? Because the gospel of Christ is there. The power of God into salvation. You believe and trust in Christ. Guess what? Now you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now you've got the God of peace with you. <coughs> Which leads me to my next point. Where God dwells today. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, we read it earlier. This is the very first verse we read starting this off. Let's go back to verse 13. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. I've talked quite a few times about my background in, in leading worship in, in churches. And uh, very early on in, in my walk, I got plugged in with a lot of denominations, leading their worship groups. And, and one of the things that I'd do is I'd sing songs and I'd pray prayers like seeking the presence of God and wel wel welcoming the presence of God into the space. And I was supposed to be an usher of the Holy Spirit. These are things that I did in times past, being ignorant of the scriptures in the word of God. But when I got into the Scriptures and I started studying, the, the Word of God straightened me out and showed me where I was wrong. Because what we just read is that where God is dwelling today is in the believer. I can't seek the presence of God because where I go, God's with me. That is incredible. Where I go, He goes. Doesn't I don't have a choice. He doesn't have a choice. We're one. So, but, but you've got preachers out there saying, oh, if you want the secret of life, you've got to seek the presence of God. You've got to get your life right. How's that working out for you? Because I tell you what, that guy probably can't even get his life straight, but he's telling people to do something that he can't do. That's why Christ came. We couldn't make ourselves right. God had to humble himself take a horrible death at Calvary, shed his own innocent blood, die for you, and then be resurrected from the dead so that you could get right with him. Four times you can read the word sealed in Paul's epistles. Three of them deal with the believer where God's spirit is. One has to deal with the collections of the saints there in, in uh, I believe it's in, in uh, Romans, book of Romans. But the point I, I'm trying to make here is that God is dwelling in the believer today. That's not how it's always been. God's Spirit, back here in Genesis 1, it hovered over the waters. Right? And then you get through the presence of God all throughout the Old Testament, even the psalm is saying, Lord, let not your spirit depart from me. The Spirit of God could leave. It could leave you. It was in the temple. It was in the most holies of holies, and then it departed from the temple, right? And then God came in the form of man, dwelt among His people, Israel, and even the twelve didn't have this thing called the sealing of the Holy Ghost. They had to endure until the end. They got clothed with power from on high in Acts chapter 1. But it isn't until you get to Paul that Paul... You, you can only read about the sealing of the Holy Spirit in Paul's epistles. You can't find it anywhere else in the Scriptures. We're living in this unique time where the Holy Spirit of God is dwelling inside us. It's amazing. It blows my mind. It doesn't make sense. And this time frame will end. That's what the great catching up of the church, the body of Christ is here. And we're going to see the wrath of God poured out upon this world. But we shouldn't be ignorant. I can't think, think of how many times Paul says, I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, of this mystery. God is dwelling in people today, and He's not dwelling in buildings And if people would realize or come to the thing, they need to, they need to look at the gospel. What is the gospel? They need to reevaluate that for themselves. What is the gospel? What have they believed? 
God only tells you one place where the gospel is. 1 Corinthians 15, let's go there. Paul says, In whom he trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. What is that gospel of your salvation? That gospel of your salvation is found in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I, Paul, declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye believed in vain. So this gospel, Paul says in Romans chapter 1, it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth. So if you believe these words that I'm about to speak to you, you are saved. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. There you have it. That's the gospel of, sal that of your salvation. If you believe that Christ died for your sins at the cross at Calvary, but not only that he died for your sins, but he was resurrected from the dead. You're saved. I got great news for you. You've got the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead sealed on you. And when God seals you, who can unseal it? Only God can unseal it. So as you walk through this life and you commit that sin, whatever it is, I got great news for you. You're still sealed. You can't lose it. 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, For God hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The moment you believed and trusted, you were made right with God, and you can't change that. That's a sealing thing. You're sealed. got resurrection power living inside you. I can't feel it. I can't see it. I'm not getting goosebumps, but I know it's there. And how do I know that? Because the Scriptures tell me that. Not because I made this up or I heard it. The Scriptures told me this. You're a temple of the Holy Ghost. Let's hang a left. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Notice what it says. In verse 17, 16, 16, verse 16. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Paul was having to straighten out the Corinthians. I don't have time to go into what they were doing there, but the Word of God is very clear. We're the temple of the Holy Ghost. Your body is the temple. You can't go to a church building. You can't go to a worship gathering to seek the presence of God. Why? Because you're the temple of the Holy Ghost. If the Spirit of Christ be in you. If you've trusted in the gospel of Christ. If you haven't trusted in Christ, if you haven't trusted and believed in the gospel of Christ, guess what? You're not a temple of the Holy Ghost. You're dead on the inside. But I got good news for you. You just believe and trust in Christ. You'll be made alive. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Second Corinthians chapter 6. Notice what it says in verse 16. Verse 16. In what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord. So God is dwelling 
in the believer. You want to seek the presence of God? I'll just look inside you. That's all I can tell you. But there's great confusion about this. Great confusion. And I was confused for many years. I was constantly trying to seek the presence of God in things that I would try and live out in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I was always unsatisfied. I didn't have righteousness because I didn't know what righteousness was until, until I came to Romans through Philemon. And I learned about the faith of Christ. And I learned about the righteousness that was imparted unto me. Not because of anything that I've done, because of the free gift. That is the most liberating thing in my entire life. That whole entire coming out from them, it's talking about the religious system. It's talking about uh, the idol worship, Baal worship. Oh man, I don't even need to go on that, but the, the scale of Baal worship today, it would blow your mind if you really realized what was happening. Enough to make you sick. So we're sealed. We're a temple of the Holy Ghost. God is dwelling in us. And I want to talk a little bit more about the Holy Spirit, right? What He's doing today, the role. I want to talk about two things, groaning and walking. So let's go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. How am I doing on time? I, I have no idea. It's 20 after. 20 after, okay. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Go Hold this. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I know there's a lot of Scripture that we're covering. I probably prepared too much. But I, I, want, I want you to see these things. We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Notice the first four verses. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, and a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. So the spirit that we have living inside us, is groaning. I, 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 can't, I can say from my life, I've never heard the, the Spirit groan, but I know it's there, and what it's doing is it's making intercession for us. That's amazing and co- brings great comfort to me, because I don't know about you, but sometimes I just don't know what to pray sometimes. Thank God we have a God that prays for us on our behalf. And there's this desire, I know for me and in my life, Sometimes I get so sick of dealing with this present evil world that we live in. I can't wait to get out of here. I'm dying. I'm like, Lord, I want my new resurrection body. That's that desire that I believe is infused my spirit with the spirit of God. We become one. It's the desire to finally be where our home is. Because I got news for you. This place is not our home. Our inheritance is not an earthly inheritance. Our inheritance is a heavenly inheritance as opposed to what the twelve and the little flock are receiving. They're inheriting the earth. We're inheriting heaven. I thank God for that. I also thank God that it's not me that I'm trying to live this life and do these works. It's God actually working in and through me to do the work of the ministry. Go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Hang a right. Great controversy and great confusion about this passage of Scripture, but with everything we've discussed, it makes perfect sense. In Philippians chapter 2, notice what it says in verse 12. 
Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Most people stop. Let's keep reading. Verse 13. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. So it's the Spirit of God that is working in and through us to carry out his will. Praise God. And it's, guess what? It's not for our glory. It's for His glory. Praise God. Amen. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that glory, that hope of glory that we have. Let's go uh, hang a left. Go back to Ephesians. Verse 30. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, Whereby, whereby ye are, there's that word again, sealed unto the day of redemption. That sealing of the day of redemption is right here when the church of the body of Christ is getting caught up out of here. And that, that, deal, that day of redemption is going to be a day of glory. All right? glory, glory is light. Think about the glory of the sun. It's light. Right? There's glory of the stars. You can see the glory of the stars at night when you look up at nighttime. There's the glory of, of the moon. We've got glory inside of us. All right? It's light. And there's something that, that Paul expounds a little bit further there in uh, Colossians chapter one, uh, 3. Colossians chapter 3. Hang on, right? We're getting a really, really good workout today with the pages. I can hear all the wrestling of the pages. It's one of my favorite sounds. In Colossians chapter 3, notice what Paul writes in those first four verses. If ye be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Set your, thing, set your affection on things above, not on the things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. I can't wait for that day. We got the Holy Spirit of God dwelling in these. It's just butt dust, right? That's what the Bible calls it. We're butt dust. We're going to re uh, this body is, it will decay and we're going to return to the dust. We're butt dust. But we got glory inside of this thing. And one day, when Christ finally comes back on the clouds, we're going to be caught up together with Him and the church, the body of Christ, and we're going to appear with Him in glory. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing today. He's sealing the believer, those that would believe and trust in Christ, death, burial, resurrection for their sins, groaning on their behalf, working in and through them to do the work of the ministry. And I do believe that there's going to come a time that the days will be so perilous, the Word of God will not be found. And when that time's up, I, this is just my opinion, I think that day will finally come. I have no idea. I don't have a date. Don't quote me. I don't. Nobody knows the date. Everybody's been thinking that's going to happen tomorrow. So, Grieve not that Holy Spirit of promise that we have inside us. We've got this hope that we know is going to happen. When Christ shall appear, we shall also appear with Him in glory. All of this, and if there's one thing you take away from all the stuff that we've talked today, all of this was a gift, folks. It was a gift. All you did was believe on the Lord. All you did was put your trust in Christ. Now it's up for us to study the Scriptures, to sh study to show thyself approved unto God. You're studying to prove yourself to God. This is all that matters. It's an individual thing. A workman. It's going to take some work. You're going to actually have to open up your Bible and read it. You're actually going to have to take time 
to maybe pull out a dictionary, know Webster's 1828 dictionary, when you come across a word that you don't understand, and then figure out what that word is. And you just do the time. You do the time. You do the work. You just study. You just do it. You get in the Scriptures. You keep reading it. Study to show thyself approved. Unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Separating the truth of God's word for what He's doing today versus what He did in times past versus what He's going to do in the ages to come. I want to end on this. Let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are His, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. The Lord knows those that are His. I take great comfort in that verse. I take great comfort knowing that I'm sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, sealed unto the day of redemption. I take great comfort in Romans chapter 7. I call it the doo-doo chapter for a reason. Because we're just butt dust. <laughs> Let's close in a word of prayer. God, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for your word and the truth therein. We thank you for that Holy Spirit of promise. We thank you for that great sealing of the church, the body of Christ, and you know those that are yours. As we depart from here, Lord, I pray that we continue to just dig into your word, dig into your scriptures, and that the word of Christ would just dwell richly in those here and those that are tuning in online, and that we continue to do the work of the ministry, to continue to do workmen's part of getting into your word, studying, rightly dividing the word of truth. We love you, Lord, and we give you thanks and praise all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being here, guys. Have a great week.